Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Echelon Cycling Podcast, where, of course, three cycling cycling nerds uh, discuss the world of cycling, what's been in the week before and what's in the week ahead. And the cast, of course, uh, consists of Patrick Blake of Audu Cycling and Mr. Curry himself, Ewan Wilson. And uh, yeah, a lot to go through. European Championships, obviously a big thing, but we're going to start with Jumbo Visma, Quick Step Merger, WTF. Um, yeah, because I swear it was literally two weeks ago we were talking about Ineos, Ineos and Sudar Quick Step, and that seemed exciting enough. And now Yumbo are in on it, and like this has literally just come out in the last, I don't know, like few hours or something before we've recorded this. And I don't know if to be excited about it, scared about it, like the prospect of Yumbo getting stronger. And I mean, we'll talk about kind of how it would work, but I feel like, I don't know. I don't know whether to actually believe if it's going to be true or not. I feel like we've been kind of teased a little bit the Ineos thing, and I'm actually not sure whether to believe it or not. So I'm kind of like reserving myself and stopping myself getting excited or emotional about it before some concrete news comes out about it. Yeah, this has all come out in the past day from Vila Flitz, which is the big Dutch language press um, out there. And they're saying, I mean, we, we've known this now for a while, that Yumbo are leaving the sport next year. Yumbo has a business not yumbo as a team they're leaving the sport we spoke a couple weeks back about the rumors with the neom city which was uh confirmed by richard blogger in interviews uh a couple months back i believe was it before the tour de france or whatever but now it's 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 thickened more apparently richard blogger who is looking for that new sponsor uh met with the owner of sudar quick step which he met up with plugger to talk about the future and apparently this uh this plot is definitely thickening also, to add to all of this spice as well, there hasn't really been any response from management. It's a weekend to begin with. Patrick Avonapol and Patrick Lefebvre. Well, no. Patrick... Many Patricks. Patrick Blake. Patrick... Oh. Patrick, Patrick, Patrick Conrad. It, it, too many, too many. Patrick Lefebvre is at a football match today. I think with the Avonapol family. Maybe, maybe Remco, maybe Remco and his dad. But they, they have missed uh, the comments from the press. And uh, Richard Ploger hasn't said anything so far <clears throat> on the record. And apparently, according to, to Daniel Benson, editor-in-chief at GCN Racing, the Yumbo Visma group chat that they have has, there are crickets, no responses from the team management and their staff. But this plan would actually mean that, a, uh, this plan would mean that Lefebvre moves across and joins the board uh, in this big merger. Also, bear in mind, Specialized have a deal with Sudal Quickstep up until 2026. So that would mean that contract being ripped up. And also, Yumbo have enough riders on their books for next year, as do Sudal Quickstep, who have also been announcing riders well, in the past couple of weeks. So an interesting old transfer, well, corporate story to lead us off this week. I mean... Does it make sense? Like you say, like the teams, Yumbo and Sudar Quickstep, have enough riders already signed. And there's like, there is some kind of cap as to how many riders you can have in a team. Like, I, I don't know what it is. Go look up the UCI rules or whatever, because I, I'm not doing it. But you can't have like 40 people in a team, right? So how does it work? Two teams combined together? Does whoever's the highest pro conti team at the moment in the uci standings do they get boosted to world tour immediately or do there is there one more kind of promotion spot in the next cycle which is like another two years away kind of what happens if it did happen hypothetically what would happen in the interim because it just sounds like it would be pure chaos basically and we haven't even gotten to the fact that the strength combining of the two teams like that would be mental in itself in terms of the, the logistics of it, we've had mergers before. Um, we had in 2021, Wanti, now known as Entermarche, they merged with CCC, which was BMC. Um, that was different because it was a team moving up from the second division, then up into the World Tour. <clears throat> Christ. And then a couple of years back as well with Cannondale Drag Pack, where we had the Cannondale squad merging with Garmin, now known as EF. Um, so we've had this before, but I don't think a team really of this caliber merging together. I think one 
the similar Ranger Shack and yeah. Leopard Trek. Yeah, yes, I think they were. Well. 2012, and that's the closest we've come in terms of prestige because Leopard Trek at that time had Tantral Lara the Schlex, like some of the biggest stars in the sports, and then merging with Radio Shack, who were on a bit of a sort of post Armstrong hangover, you could say, but. It's, I don't. It's it's worrying because these two teams are probably, I mean, bar UAE, two strongest in the sport in terms of like helping them in in, in their weaknesses. Like Yumbo Visma, yes, they have Olaf Koy and he's contracted for a while, but Sudal's strength in, in the sprints would really sort of fill in a hole at Yumbo Visma, and then even the ball being there with Roglic and Vingegaard, disgusting. Yeah, I mean, it would definitely kill the sport of it, like you said. I Yeah, I think basically t- number one and maybe number four, maybe, if you say the big teams. Who's number three, then? Ineos, Ineos. no? Are you uh, putting... Are you, well, that's so washed. <laughs> to be fair, now you say that's it. So this is like Ineos 2021, I'm thinking of. 2023? Hmm... And yeah. 2023 is fully like pro conti level. It's not even that good. Oh, that's me. <laughs> Come I, on, Carlos Rodriguez, Paul. I would, I would legit take like so that, like Fifth. a lot of oh, destiny. No, you're in fourth. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't know. But then there's even like, I mean, we'll get on to it. But there's also like for Roglic rumor mills still going round and round. Um, yeah, like Avonpool and Vingegaard. And Sepkus, who is now this Grand Tour enigma, and maybe Roglic, and Wild Van Aert, and Laporte. It's like, you know, the sport was was dead enough as it is. <laughs> I don't need this to come and, like, really kill off the race. Because, like, Jumbo have already been dominating. I really don't need even a pool to be with them as well. Just to like really put the nail in the coffin, but yeah, I don't know. Do you think it's actually going to happen, or is this just like a? Is it too soon to tell? I hope not. You better not. I hope not. I hope it doesn't happen. You don't want to lose teams anyway, so it's kind of like, yeah, yeah. As, especially like two highly competitive teams to see them merge. Like it'll be cool if Yumbo merged with. Oh, the remnants of human powered health, for instance. That would be really cool. I mean, it's more of a pseudal thing to do that, but like jumping in with, with with one of these other teams that needs a little bit more support. But this is literally like, yeah, two of the strongest teams in the game. Uh they do have one spot still free. Michel Hessman is uh doesn't look like he's coming back. So I guess that opens up a little bit of space there. And um, Nathan yeah. Hoindoink retiring. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, we 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 should probably get on to that as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, we get to the Euros, Tarling, uh, Laporte, etc. But yeah, what did you guys? Obviously, uh, Ewan was the one who first told us about this. But Nathan on Hoindoink retiring. But Ewan, what what was kind of the the sequence of events that led to this retirement? Surreal story, really. Nathan van Hoydon, Tour de France um, teammate. He attacked on that final stage on the Champs Elysees. Let's not forget with uh, with Tadej Pogacar. But Nathan van Hoydon, he lost consciousness at the wheel uh, whilst driving. That forced him to accelerate, and he crashed his car uh, in what was a very nasty road incident. Uh, his partner was in the car as well, who uh is pregnant still is pregnant it's it's it's, it's all going okay in, in in that department but Nathan van Hoydonk he had to go to hospital it wasn't looking very good to begin with he was in a medically induced coma but now he's uh he's woken up but um it has brought with it uh the realization of a heart problem which does mean that he is forced to retire we, we saw this with Sonny Corbinelli as well following his cardiac arrest last year at the Volta Catalonia we've also seen it in uh, in football as well, for instance, Denmark's Christian Eriksen, who had a cardiac arrest at the Euros in 2020, stroke 21, where he uh, had to leave Italy due to the the, the, the sporting rules there. Uh, so Nata van Hoydag sadly has had to retire. It's it's such a sort of surreal story. We didn't really touch on it last week. It was a little bit too raw, but now we have a, a better sort of pathway of things to come. But 
Another sort of nasty incident as well, Wesley Crater of uh, Cofidis worrying as well. He had a, a cardiac arrest. He's back on the bike. He posted a picture on Instagram or Twitter this week uh, of him and his kit on the bike. So that's surprising, at least for me, uh, to see him back on the bike and train it again. We wait to see what the uh, what the outcome of that will be. We don't know if they fitted the sort of heart monitor or whether they've found a, a cardiac problem, but for Van Hoedonk, it's definitely the end of the road. Such a shame for a rider who was really coming into his own in the past couple of years. So influential in Jumbo Visma's big victories. I mean, do you remember Michael Goulart in the 23-year-old who had a heart attack during Paro Bay? I mean, that was in 2018. I think all of this is kind of like... It's quite worrying that riders are having heart attacks. They're all in the, yeah, the prime in their 20s, 30s, etc. Yeah, this this shouldn't be happening. Yeah. I remember it also happening with, I just looked him up, Gianni Meersman. He used to ride for Sudar Quickstep. He was like a Belgian sprinter. He was forced to retire in 2014, 2015, I want to say, because of a heart problem. It definitely seems like something more more prevalent or maybe it's got the same prevalence but we just know how to detect it better so yeah hopefully we can get a bit of a grasp as to what's causing this and hopefully stopping it similarly Diego Lissi had uh, some cardiac problems for a while that ruled him out of racing so this does seem to be a sort of a recurring theme I mean, it's not just isolated to cycling. You see it in, in other sports as well. Football, we spoke about Christian Eriksen, but there's also been other, other cases. Fabrice from Wamba, uh, back in the sort of late 2000s, early 2010s as well, had a high-profile uh, hashtag on the football pitch. We see it with runners and so forth. It might, it might just be like a thing with high-intensity sport, especially from such a young age and at such an intensity. I mean, we all say this. None of us are cardiologists as well, so it's not like we can comment on it. But, I mean, it's just worrying sights, uh, to be honest. And, I mean, yeah, we might as well move on because this story is quite sad and losing, yeah, Nathan Mann Hoindoink. People having heart attacks while well, they're doing what they want to do uh, as for profession is not really what you want to talk about. European Championships, let's go there. Uh, how did you kind of, well, what was your kind of highlight? Obviously, we saw Josh Tarling winning, beating Wat Van Aert. Stefan Kuhn had a horrific crash as well. Still managed to finish. And uh, yeah, then we saw Laporte, well, probably to Ewan's Great pleasure. Uh, beat beat out uh, Wat Van Aert once again. Poor out. I really wanted to, him to win. It was an interesting world champ, uh, world champ, European Championships. I thought it was actually some of the kind of better racing of the year. I really enjoyed watching it, uh, especially like you know, if you haven't watched the last twenty thirty kilometers of the European men's road race, go and watch that. That was a really good finale. Came right down to the wire. Just seeing the finishing line photo doesn't give justice to how good it is. So I'd highly recommend you go back and watch it. But lots of deserving winners. Lots of surprise winners as well, I think, which is good to see. You know, not just the usual names, kind of, you know, what we kind of have termed the Galacticos sort of riders in the past. But kind of a bit fresh like in the women's racing as well we saw Bledevold winning I know it's an SD Works rider but it's a different SD Works rider you know it wasn't a Vibas or a Kapeki so it's something a little bit different and for that I was quite thankful actually I thought it was good yeah it, the men's race was actually it, it was a really captivating watch and seeing Laporte get a big win as well is quite nice. I know it's a little bit like cliche for me to say that, but I, he, he's, he's a guy who sacrificed so much for other people and to, to see him get a win ahead of Wild Bernard, who he's usually supporting, it's nice. It's very nice. Also, my hot take of the road race. Uh, it's not really a hot take. I think Arno De Lee, if he was the Belgian leader, would have got that. He looked really, really good in that final circuit. And I hope we have more racing around this Col de Van. We saw it with the Dutch Championships as well. Provides great racing, and this was a really good road race. I mean, Patrick literally said that as well. He was like, why weren't they working for Arnold Dilly? Uh Yeah, but in terms of staying with Wat Van Aert, we'll go... Well, actually, Josh Tarling or Wat Van Aert? We'll go with Wat Van Aert. We've just covered it before with the monuments, but now it's another championships where he's finishing second. Second at the Worlds. Second at the Worlds a few years ago as well. Is he just not meant to win a big championship 
second at the Olympic Games as well, and in Tokyo. Wow, there we go. Yeah, exactly. Proving my point, nonetheless. <laughs> Cyclocross World Championships, he was second. Do you want to keep going? <laughs> It, it is it is a recurring theme and it's i mean we, we've spoken about it a lot it's like wow is really good at a lot of things but doesn't seem to be able to he's not necessarily the best at anything if that makes sense like he's outdone both by vanderpool on raw speed and a sprint he's out sprinted by, by other guys and here it just seemed like wow just missed out and as well because he's always relying on these teammates in these international competitions belgium is such a force maybe he gets outplayed by, by other nations because everyone's looking at him and belgium which is usually typically at any given championships olympics whatever are one of the strongest teams on paper but yeah also adding in a bronze medal in the the the, the time trial as well just missing the mark there. You don't even have team tactics in, in a time trial. It's all about uh, your own effort. So, yeah, it's definitely look, looking like he's cursed at international races. Even though on this podcast, we may have at times been a, said said things about Wout Van Aert, <laughs> which haven't been the kindest. I think, you know, I know Scott and I, we were, I was rooting for Wout to win this. I was like, I want... I wanted Wout to win because, like you said, Scott, it would have been so cool to have him in the European stripes, Van der Poel in the World Champ Bands, head to head in the Classics next year. I'm like, yes, I want that. I was trying to manifest it in my mind, and God, it came so close. I was like, <laughs> literally, the last corner, I was like, Wout, please, please do it. I mean, Laporte's still going to be there in the classics don't get me wrong he is still a very good classics rider but you know when the cream really rises to the top in the last half hour of flanders you know we saw it this year it's it was pagatra van der Poel and wout and it would just be so cool to have seen wout win it so yeah i mean i'd love him to kick this curse i think <laughs> i'm past the point of being like hating on wow i'm just like please Please do it because I would. I don't want to feel like guilty for making it. Kind of, I don't know, feeling this way. I'm gonna. I'm gonna uh, play devil's advocate. Or oh wow, shock, shock! But I've never seen yeah. this. <laughs> but like, if if it were so, Van der Poel's world champion, uh, Pogacar's Slovenian champion, and then if Wout was European champion, that would just would have been three people. Wearing white champions jerseys, I need some. I need some color contrast. I need some interesting stuff going on. If Wout were Belgian champion, he didn't, and he didn't choke that one, um, <laughs> I'd say that would be that would be a cool little picture. Uh, a bit like the sort of the you know those bone and that bone and Cancellara season in two thousand ten. We had them both in the, in the national champions kits. I think that's like you get lots of iconic photos of that season. Could have been like that, but um, yeah, I mean. It's it, it would be cool to see what 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 when I win it. Well, to, to like wear just in the jersey, but at the same time, it's almost part of the charm now to like see him see him miss the mark. It's like twenty fourteen era Sagan, where like he was just finishing second all the time. It was like his thing. Yeah, but that's the thing. Winning doesn't necessarily mean that you're like the greatest because Sagan, like you said, finished second so many times, and he is considered to be one of the greatest of the sport. Like people love Sagan because I don't know, but he they, he went through that period of second places. I don't know. But yeah, I'm mean, sure he, it was the second places and not his yeah, three yeah. world Honestly, championships, the, the Parave, all that, mm -hmm. his seven green jerseys. I'm sure it was the second places that made him Yeah, yeah, it's definitely I mean if you're worried about wow not wearing a special jersey, I'm sure Yumbo will just bring out another one off kit like they always do for every single race that they decide to participate in. So I wouldn't be too worried about that. Stupid one off kits. Hashtag ride your dreams. So well, they came dinner. true. They came true, not for wow, but everyone else. Fed up a one off kit. Somebody stop him. Yeah, well, can you see wow winning anything? I mean, he's not. There's the new generation coming through as well, Anna Dili, Koi as well. They're faster than him on a given day in a sprint. I just love how you just said his wild but art's gonna win anything. <laughs> like, I, like he's just too harsh. he's just dropped off a cliff. He's never he's like with... <laughs> so sorry, Wow. I'm sure we're not allowed to be in hotels at any time soon. They probably have um, FGs of us in hotels right now. 
Has it just been an unlucky season? Do we just draw? Do we, he'll draw a line under it, and we'll get to twenty twenty four, and White will win loads, and it'll all be fine. I did think when Maybe. he turned around Laporte and looked at Wout in the sprint, he should have screamed, "Get Wevel game this year! Remember, I give you the title. Give me this." But that was because that was because he was going to win the next week at Ronda. Um, oh for, yes, yeah. I don't think it's a cursed season. I think this this is just a common theme with Valverde. You know, yeah, it's like <laughs> finishing things. finishing second is like his thing now. Uh, I'm <laughs> trying to find out where the Europeans are next year, just so we have like uh, you can speculate whether he, he has a chance next year. It's in Limburg. Ah, oh. this, oh. this is it. The stars are aligning. Next. Oh damn. What one our European champion next year? And the Olympics. Nah. Mathieu. Um, yeah. It's like four man teams in the Olympics. It's mental. We might as well touch on him then. Uh Macho Van der Poel is going to the Olympics, but it says he's doing the mountain bike. Yeah. I think it makes sense. Don't you think? Because the road race is going to be because it's like around Paris, isn't it? Or somewhere around it. It's gonna be dead flat. Like, ain't no way. But... Oh, has it got has it got hills in it? Yeah. So, um, in Paris, there's this uh, there's this hill called well, this part of the city called Montmartre, which is like on a hill where cycle occurs. Mm-hmm. They're going up that, and it's got a cobble climb, a cobble climb that's very short and steep. Why is Machu not going? It, it's it, no. Th- th- this genuinely frustrates me because okay, great, he he has a really good chance in the mountain bike, woohoo! But in the road race, oof. He has, he has a really good chance. He's also quite like he's spiritually connected to France um, with his grandfather and his mother. It'd be really cool to see him go there and then win. But if not, it's going to be Poggy or Arno oh. Dilly. Who's I mean, going to win? What about, I mean, yeah, Golden Mathieu. Can you imagine it? Like a four year spell of Mathieu with like a bright gold like Abus. Why cyclocross not in the Olympics? Like honestly, or at least the winter. Yeah, we only get two events at the Olympics. It's absolute sacrilege when swimming gets like. Yeah, well, they they would though say strokes. it's the velodrome. They would say, "Well, you got the velodrome events, you got BMX, you got mountain bike, but it's that's not, not the same thing. thing. It's not the same thing. We need like, we need like a a road race and the TT, but then we need like a but we need like a road race, which is kind of like a bird, like a hilly one. Then we need like a flat one for like sprinters, or like a crit one or something like that, which is like an hour long. Oh. Idea for the International Olympic Committee: um, a stage race, like you have oh. like an Olympic stage race where you got like a time trial, sprint stage, mountain stage, and a hilly stage. A bit like the old the old school Criterium International when that was in Corsica. The leader wears a golden jersey, and at the end you have. The, the Olympic stage race champion. And that would be truly like, f- f- forget the Tour de France, the Olympic stage race champion. Bragging rights. Yeah, forget the, forget the tour for a four-day event. I mean, I like the sound of that. I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, I do as well. But I, I don't think the IOC are listening to us, unfortunately. Does the winner of each stage get a gold medal? Or is it just the person Ooh. who wins it overall? No, so that kind of makes winning a stage a bit redundant, especially a sprint one. But that's true. They could, I don't know. They they still get to raise their hands in the air, or maybe they don't celebrate. That's like an unwritten rule. That's very cycling. Have like an unwritten rule if you don't celebrate. But then in pentathlon, like people don't celebrate like every time, or like heptathlon or decathlon, whatever. People don't celebrate. Yes, I came first in in, in the long jump. They wait until the end. So how come athletics can have all this stuff, but cycling can't? Answer yourself, International Olympic Committee. I think it's a good point, actually. But nevertheless, moving on, Josh Tarling, 20 years old, I think now, won the time trial event incredibly, already the British champion, now the European champion as well, following someone in Remco Venerable's footstep. My question here is, is this the next big thing for British cycling? Is he going to win the Tour de France? Is he going to win the Tour de France in his career? That's what I'm saying here. I'm going to be pessimistic and say no. Why? Because, because he would the, be the tallest, tallest ever Tour de France winner. Because of all the freaking cracked kids we've got already, who are like in the embryo as it is. <laughs> like, I don't, I just he's gonna. I don't know. I feel like the days of like 
for some reason, Ineos haven't got out of this thing of Bradley formed a time trialist into a Grand Tour rider, and for some reason, they think that the path to success is to get time trialists and try and form them into climbers. But I'm just not sure if that's... They seem to be like, thing like, I don't know, like Luke Plapp, Ethan Hater, Leo Hater, this Michael Leonard guy, Ganner. Like they're just bringing time trialists, time trialists, time trialists. And they think that because they've got like this good kind of aerobic engine and time trialing ability, they've kind of like ticked one box. And it's like, well, can we just form them into a climber? And I would love to just see Tarling just be like the new Ganner and just kind of like smash TTs and just win Rene Whitehall every year just by like a minute because of a dominant TT and win that, you know, Terreno Adriatico TT that happens at the end of every race. I feel like there's something quite pure about like the dominant TT rider. Like we just have a lot of guys who are quite hybrid now who are really good at time trialing, but they're also a Grand Tour rider. And I quite like the simplicity of just like a, a one track. But I don't know if that's just me being old school. No, he's not winning the Tour de France. Um, he's guy is killing the clip. There's the segment. Yeah. <laughs> he even, like, I, <clears throat> the thing he said about the World Championships, like, it wasn't a route that suited me because it was too hilly because I was, like, one hill at the end. If he can't get up that that, that climb to Sterling Castle, he's not going to go up out the West and win it. Neo pro season, and he's 20. Like, Bradley he's Wiggins 19, wasn't... actually. He's 19. Are you sure? Are you yeah, because he's he's born in the same week as me, uh, but in 2004. I mean, Ayuso was on the podium of the Vuelta when he was 19. We're in a really? region of, of hype kids who are just like popping four espressos at breakfast. Like, they're, they're absolutely wired. And like if you're not a GC rider by the time you're like 22... It's almost like we've entered a, a realm now post COVID where if you're not if you're not there by you're under twenty three, like you, that's it. <laughs> like it's an absolute cutthroat way that cycling has turned into now because of this Pigaccia and Ayuso kind of spearing the way even a pool as well. I would love to see it though, to be honest with you. I feel like if Tarlin could become decent at climbing, and I'm not just talking about I I see you UAE tour rider people in the comments section saying that Josh Tarling did good on this on the Jabal Health Hefe. I'm like right, I'm like, let's sack that off. Cause that does doesn't count because it's one climb at the end of a sandstorm. I'm talking like multiple alpine climbs. Like if Tarling can become the new G B kind of G C threat, then great. But I don't know. I'm not really sure about GC's G C ambitions. Like, like in the future, like I know we got like Pidcock, which we've talked about loads about his GC prospects, but I don't know. I'm just not sure if GB are really cut out for that thing at the moment. I think we're like we're still hanging on to this Froome and Wiggins and G thing, and we just need to kind of like let it go and transform ourselves into the one day dominating team that we were always designed to be. I think he would actually, if he hypothetically slimmed down and used his incredible engine to become the next Bradley Wiggins, etc., etc. He would be the tallest ever winner of the tour. One okay. meter ninety-four. Okay. Bradley Wiggins was one meter ninety. Miguel Engel Ryan one meter eighty-eight. But I feel like the the Wiggins type of rider doesn't win Grand Tours anymore though. Yeah. Like you need you need to be like those guys won in the past because they just shat on a bar day or a I don't know Joaquin Rodriguez because they couldn't time trap to save a life you know they put three minutes into them but I just you know to win a grand tour now you need to be like a Pagatra and a Jonas you need to have this proper snap on a climb and I'm just not sure if the diesel TT engine Wiggins-esque rider is the type of person who wins a grand tour anymore bear in mind Wiggins won a grand tour with like 80 kilometers of time trialing in it <laughs> it was, there we go. It was yeah, a so, exceptional Tour de France. That could happen again, and then Josh Tarling just takes over the reins at Ineos. I mean, no, no, time trials aren't cool anymore because uh, because Jonas destroyed everybody. They're going to stop doing them, I reckon. I just need to stop making them uphill. Just How make about them flat, like normal? 
They were fishing. Hundred K. Hundred K team time trial. Yeah. Oh, team they time had trial. That. Yeah, team time trial. Hundred K. They should do it around Disneyland. <laughs> Why? Can you imagine Ineos's TTT team with Ghana and Tarling? Just set them off. I mean, before we come to the right of the week, there have been a few transfers as well. And apparently, something to do with Ineos Grandiers, which we've been waiting an eternity for. And uh, Patrick, you flagged this up. So, do we all remember the 17-year-old Albert Philipson, who won the Junior Men's World Road Race he then won like the Olympic, whatever, mountain bike world championship. He's the junior champion of every freaking thing under the sun, basically. But he's 17 and Ineos are apparently closing in on signing him. And people are talking about this AJ August guy who was also this American kid who was also decent in the TT at the Worlds. And it's all part of this Ineos you know, 20, whatever, 37 plan to win the tour or whatever. But basically, they're signing up kids at this point. But this Albert Philipson guy does seem like the real deal, to be honest with you. The fact that he's also got that mountain biking part in him, you, we, we know how Ineos love a mountain biker, you know? They love a Pidcock, they love a Pauline Fallon Provo, you know, they're, they're, they are all over that. If you are multidisciplined, they are all over you, like mold on a shower curtain. So... What do you reckon? Is this is this Danish guy the next Jonas? I feel like the next like Van Le Paul, in it. Oh. Yeah. First ever Dane on Ineos as well, ending the hatred of Danish riders. Yeah, yeah. which is interesting because they've had a rider from like most other Nordic countries. They've had a Finnish rider in the past. They've had a Swedish rider, an American rider. No, not a Norwegian rider. Don't know how that one got mixed up. There. Yeah, Edvard Bosenhagen. <laughs> uh, and the large Peter Nordhal. Yeah. Um, but they've never had and get Gabriel Rash. Let's not forget him. But they've never had a Dane. I think the thing that's kind of crazy, you know, given how like how big of a powerhouse the uh the country are, that's yeah, that's now, not like ten years ago. Like Danish riders were right, not great. They, I, I guess because they used to have a team, you know. They used yeah, to exactly. have a Danish team in the world tour. You want to know something else? He he also does cross. <laughs> Gosh. He's the Danish junior cyclocross champion as well. So he's got another discipline there. I think having that multidiscipline thing, and he also does good in one day races, is a good sign that he actually has tactical nous. Like he's not just some, we're going to plop you at the bottom of the climb and you're just going to go brr with your legs and just go and win to the top of the climb by doing some watts per kilo, which are just ungodly. Like winning one day races show you got a bit of tactical nous, which is good. It kind of shows like a Pagacha esque sort of trajectory. The fact that Pagacha can win do well in one day races and the tour is the sign of a great rider. And I think that this guy is already sort of showing those sorts of qualities. So I'm very interested for what you you know, twenty twenty three we're in. Twenty twenty eight, you know, put it in your diary. July twenty twenty eight. This guy might just well win the tour. And we might very well still be doing this podcast. If any bookmakers are do are taking bets, yeah, the France winners of two thousand twenty eight, they do that sometimes. They had it with Eddie Dunbar when he was eighteen. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And as I always say, bet responsibly. The bookmakers always win. Eddie Dunbar still doesn't have a Tour de France title, and he's what 26, 27 now. Yet, yet it can still yeah. happen. Oh, oh he, he hasn't ridden the Tour de France yet, so it's, it's only a matter of time. But yeah, I mean. Are Ineos just going to sign kids now? They're not going to yes. go anywhere. They're not going to... They've been doing this for a year now as well. Last year, it was, a, it was a whole crash. It was a whole kids club. It was a high school cycling team almost. They were signing like 19-year-olds left, right, and center. And I think this is kind of on brand. And apparently the AJ Jensen guy, the American, could have Scandinavian roots. Could be Jensen. Apparently his stats are like intergalactic. They're insane. And... Any of us need to sign someone, please. They need to get someone on those on their books. Speaking yeah. of which, other transfers that came through: David Ballerini is moving to As- is moving to Astana, Kazakhstan. Thought that one was a bit spicy. All part of a Cav project, because I think I saw somewhere that he is ah. like very close to officially saying that he 
is carrying on for another season. I'm not sure if it's confirmed, but it's very close. So Ballerini going back. I swear I saw some other lead out, man. Morkouf apparently might be leaving Sudar Quickstep. I saw that, and he didn't rule out the possibility that he might be going to Astana. I feel like he would probably try to help Cav, you know, win the next one, you know, the elusive stage. I think that Morkouf has that sentimentality towards trying to help Cav to do that. I think I feel like a lot of signings for Astana are doing it just literally to help Cav. I think they all want to be a kind of a part of this squad that might go to the tour that's going to kind of break the kind of the Eddie Merckx like just nut and just bang, just smack through it. Also, as well, Jake, not Jake Stewart, Matt Walls of Bora Hansker is linked to Groupama Francaise Deja. I think yeah. Jake Stewart oh. is. He's going to Israel. Yeah, yes. I thought he was going to Astana, so that, that confused me a bit. Yeah, it was initially Astana a couple months back, and then he ended up going to Israel with Ethan Vernon as well. I don't know if they have the same agent. Wasn't it George Bennett as well when Israel? Yeah, George Bennett, and like, he posted a thank you, you at ET Memorads for everything. Yeah, he's going to either Sudal or Israel. Strange transfers. But um, yeah, we might as well go to Rider of the Week. Uh, obviously, the European Championships have, yeah, happened. But uh, there were a few other victory, uh, other stage races as well. Okay, no, before we do that, podcast favorite, I kid you not, Miguel Angel Lopez is having the worst, e- well, a great first half of the year, winning nine stages of the Col- World to Colombia, San Luis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But now. <laughs> Apparently, he was kidnapped and robbed in his own home. And uh, yeah, there was a bit of problems with the news, I think. They said he had $800,000 in his apartment or house or whatever. And then they quickly retracted that. And it was 800,000 pesos, which amounts to about 1,400. So changes the story a bit. But yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, or Miguel Angel Lopez. Not a great time for him. And uh, yeah. yeah, but I thought I'd just That's cool. drop in that sad news about a podcast favorite. Well, just before we move on to the ride of the week, do you know what else is funny about Ineos? I'm going back to like the transfers. <laughs> is this just I, random I, I, segment? I, I, Superman I, Lopez, please. I, the man has been I, kidnapped. I you know, like Ineos, basically, like two, any, two great British talents just go to EF. In Jack Root King Gray, who finished fourth at the under twenty three world like championship. Yes. That's sacrilege. Yeah. And Lucas Naroka, who won a stage of a baby zero, and Ineos didn't sign either of them and they've both gone to EF, which is a complete F up in my eyes. From Ineos who are in this rebuilding whatever phase, trying to sign youngsters, it's like you just missed two of them. What are you doing? So I just want yeah, anyway, you, you, we can go talk about Miguel Angel Lopez now. I think you're right. Well, this is a Ineos Grenadiers transfer. What is going on? They'll be yeah, great in is... five years. Yeah, that was that was quite weird. But nevertheless, we'll try again. Rider of the week. A lot of yeah. a lot has happened. Jasper Philipson even picked up a victory on Sunday today of recording. But yeah, who's your rider of the week? You and we'll go with you first. Please don't pick my rider. I'm going for you and Wilson favorite. He's back, baby, winning in the tour of Lankawi. It's Gleb Siritsa. I saw this coming when I saw that. <laughs> Big man Gleb is back in business. And I'm so proud to see that he is my ride of the week. I'm, I'm expecting him to scoop up wins at the Tour de Lankawi. Over to the studio. Thank you, Ewan. <laughs> um, my ride of the week, going a little bit under the radar again, I'm going to go with Arthur Cluckers of Tudor Pro Cycling. He finished 11th in GC at the recent Tour of Luxembourg, which was won by and Mark Hershey, who's also back. But when you look at the riders around him, like he was beating Jorgensen, Dylan Turns, Tobias Haaland, Johannesson, Fausto Masnada, Arambaru, Tijpanu, Madwas. Like he's surrounded by some very good names. And I just think that this kind of youngster, 23 years old, Tudor on the rise, made some good signings, and I think that he's going to be a good part of their squad come 2024. So I think this is a good sign of things to come. 
Yeah, we didn't talk much about the Tour of Luxembourg. 1-2 for UAE, Mark Hirschi, Brendan McNulty, Ben Healy back on a podium. Yeah, so now you guys have forced my hand once again because we can't have a rider of the week where there's not a European champion picked in the European Championship. No, uh, 11th place at Luxembourg at a stage win at the Tour of Langkawi. Okay, so I'm going to have to pick, well, I'm not picking up port. I kind of do want to, but I'm going to go for Josh Tarling because 19 years old, yeah. all that. Uh, I think that's incredible. I think he's been right of the week maybe before. Maybe not. Might be the first time. Probably like Cowie, nice. really? You're 11th. Guys, what is happening? Well, listen, we're keeping it understated. The whole point of this is to not pick the obvious guys. We're giving justice to the little man. I was going to say, the little man is Club Siritsa, who is uh, 85 oh, kilograms in one meter 90. He is built like a big, like a brick poo house, outdoor shitter. Like a wolf couldn't blow down. But he's, um, yeah, he's he's my boy. Anyways, with that, uh, thank you for all staying through that right of the week section. That's it for... Number 35, we're on our way to 100. Make sure to hit the like button, get involved in the conversation down below in the comment section. And that's basically it for us. Thank you very much for listening and we will see you around.